I recently paid an unforgettable visit to the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia, and during this visit, I found something out about the scientific process that I really had never considered. Science isn't about proving your theory right. It's actually proving that you're not wrong. And so when people ask me why don't we just send a life detection experiment to Mars, something that we can be certain about, for example, a scanning electron microscope that could definitely show us the bacteria once we gather it, well, there's always a possibility that someone could claim that the bacteria had hitched a ride on the spacecraft and was actually from Earth. There's always ways that doubt can be introduced introduced into any theory, and when that happens, your theory becomes invalid until you can prove that you're not wrong, and never can you carry enough scientific equipment with you to prove that you're not wrong. That being the case, we are never going to send another life detection experiment to another world, something similar to the label release experiment that was carried on the Viking spacecraft. Because even though the label release experiment showed positive results on two different occasions and also showed positive results after quite an extensive effort was made to try to prove that they weren't wrong, there was another instrument on the spacecraft that showed negative results, something that was looking for organic molecules and it came up blank. And even though we have found organic molecules on Mars since then, even though we know for a fact that the label release experiment produced positive positive results, that there are organic molecules on Mars together with lots and lots of other evidence for the existence of current life on the red planet, we don't have enough evidence to prove that we're not wrong. And we're never going to get that kind of information until we bring a sample back or until astronauts actually visit the red planet themselves. And so that's why the search for life in the solar system and especially beyond our solar system is so incredibly frustrating and why so many quote serious unquote astronomers don't pursue it. And that being the case, I tend to think that the solar system is full of life, brimming over with life, that life is as natural a process as gravity is. And even when you're exploring worlds that are well outside the so-called Goldilocks zone, the so-called region of any solar system that is conducive to the evolution and sustainability of life as we know it, even when you go beyond this region, you can find substantial evidence for the existence of life. And in the case of the moons of Saturn, in my opinion, we've found evidence that most, under normal circumstances, would regard as being quite conclusive. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. When I was a kid, the idea of looking for life in the Saturnian system seemed pretty far-fetched. The temperatures in the upper clouds of Saturn are minus 178 degrees Celsius. It's an insanely cold place, and with those kinds of temperatures, you don't get liquid water, and if you don't have liquid water, life as we know it is usually impossible. All of that having been said, though, we never can considered looking for life beneath the surface of Saturn's moons. Once we had determined that only one of Saturn's moons had an atmosphere, that of course being Titan, and once we realized that this atmosphere was quite poisonous to life as we know it, being mostly comprised of methane rather than oxygen or nitrogen, anything friendly to our type of life, well, it became pretty clear that life on the surface of Saturn's moons, again, life as we understand it, was probably impossible, and the solar system was beginning to look like a pretty lifeless place indeed. 
That is to say, before we started looking beneath the surface of these moons. And it was then we began to wonder, might there be liquid water within these tiny bodies? But how do we even come up with such an idea? And how do we know that these oceans are actually there? Well, fortunately, there was enough about Saturn, or rather Saturn's rings, to prove that we weren't wrong about an ocean existing beneath the surface of at least one of its moons, that moon being Enceladus. Orbiting Saturn is, of course, a massive, glorious ring system, but there's one ring in particular that puzzled scientists for a considerable amount of time since its discovery in the 1960s, and this was the E-ring, a tiny ring that was invisible most of the time, consisting entirely of these strange ice crystals totally different from the rest of the rings, both in terms of appearance and composition. Where did these ice crystals come from? Well, it appeared that there was a brightening point where the ring crossed the orbit of the moon Enceladus. And so it was hypothesized that this ice might be somehow coming from Enceladus. But how? Well, we didn't get our proof until recently when the Cassini probe was sent to try to unlock some of Saturn's mysteries and perhaps unlocked the biggest mystery of all, how these oceans actually exist, where they might be, and might they actually be home to something living. After extensive observation of Enceladus and the rest of Saturn's moons, it was determined that massive geysers of liquid water were erupting from the surface of Enceladus. We're talking thousands and thousands of kilometers into space, and the ice crystals from this geyser were captured by Saturn's gravity and formed the E-ring. Billions of kilograms of ice crystals were being ejected into space and forming the E-ring. How could this much water actually exist beneath the surface of this tiny moon? Well, in 2008, NASA decided to make a very risky move to determine as much as they could about this mysterious ocean beneath Enceladus's surface by doing something with Cassini that it was not designed to do, plunging it directly through the plume and using its cosmic dust analyzer tool to try to gather as much information about these particles as possible. As you can probably imagine from the name of the instrument, the Cosmic Dust Analyzer was never supposed to be analyzing anything from Saturn's moons. Instead, it was just supposed to be analyzing the dust that exists between planets really not supposed to be used for these types of purposes. Cassini was not a Viking type spacecraft, but the analyzer did have enough tools to at least rule out certain possibilities and also firmly establish whether or not these particles were actually ice and what else might be present in them. Although, as I said before, this thing wasn't really designed to be a full sample analyzer, and that being the case, there were certain elements that really couldn't be detected. So frustratingly, once again, because NASA doesn't like putting life detection equipment on their probes, we now had a probe coming into direct contact with an ocean other than Earth's for the first time in history, and it was poorly equipped to detect anything that might be living in this ocean. That being the case, however, a lot of evidence was still piled up by Cassini and by subsequent observations. For one thing, it was determined absolutely that Enceladus harbors a vast salty ocean perhaps more water than Earth has, that's interacting with a rocky core, driving hydrothermal activity similar to Earth's deep sea vents. This was confirmed by Cassini when Cassini detected dissolved salts and silica nanoparticles indicative of hot, rocky seafloor conditions. Therefore, there was liquid water, there was heat, and there was salt. These three elements are extremely conducive to the evolution of life. But certainly that wasn't enough, right? Well, 
In addition to that, hydrogen gas was detected in the plumes in 2017. This suggested the chemical reactions at these hydrothermal vents were taking place, providing energy for hydrogen oxidizing microbes, much like those on Earth. And a 2023 study identified phosphorus, a key nutrient for life in the form of dissolved phosphates, completing the roster of life's essential elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Everything necessary for life to thrive beneath the surface of Enceladus was there. But still, that's not enough. We need more to prove that we're not wrong. Well, this has recently been discovered as well. For one thing, Cassini found simple organic molecules like methane and carbon dioxide early on. But just a few days ago, it was announced that by using new types of advanced mass spectroscopy techniques, we have found a lot more compelling organic molecules than that. And Enceladus's oceans are almost certainly home to some type of life, possibly multicellular life, perhaps advanced multicellular life. It's difficult to say, but life looks very likely indeed. And this is according to a new study that was published in the journal Nature Astronomy. Quote, Cassini was detecting samples from Enceladus all the time as it flew through Saturn's E-ring, according to lead author and Freie Universität Berlin researcher Nozer Kawaja. Quote, we had already found many organic molecules in these ice grains, including precursors for amino acids. Specifically, the team examined ocean spray data collected by Cassini's cosmic dust analyzer. The ice grains contain not just frozen water, but other molecules, including organics. Since these particular particles traveled fast enough, roughly 11.2 miles per second, when hitting the instrument, they didn't cluster, giving researchers a chance to see these previously hidden signals, according to Nazaire. They found evidence that the organic molecules originated in Enceladus's ocean, including ones never observed before, such as signs of nitrogen and oxygen-bearing compounds, ethers and esters. These organic molecules are involved in the kinds of chemical reactions that are believed to have eventually led to the formation of life on Earth, making this, of course, extremely exciting. Quote, there are many possible pathways from the organic molecules we found in the Cassini data to potentially biologically relevant compounds, which enhances the likelihood that the moon is habitable. And these aren't the only molecules that have been detected in Enceladus's oceans that suggest the presence of life. In addition to that, a particular combination of carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen in the plume is suggestive of a process known as methanogenesis, a metabolic process that produces methane. Methanogenesis is widespread on Earth, of course, and may have been critical to the origin of life on our planet. There are frankly many different ways that life could have evolved in the oceans of Enceladus and many clues that suggest very strongly that life is thriving in the oceans of Enceladus right now. As a matter of fact, the researchers for this particular study say that if life is not discovered, that is something that needs to be studied as well, because given the conditions and the presence of all of the vital chemicals that are here in this ocean, there should be life. And if there isn't, we need to find out why there isn't. And we're just getting started. The moon Titan, which seemed so inhospitable at first when we're talking about temperatures and the composition of its atmosphere, is confirmed to have a global salty liquid water ocean beneath its icy crust as well. And there's also evidence for active methanogenic life on the surface of Titan based on results from a European Space Agency lander that set down on the moon some time ago. 
We don't know for certain, but it was predicted that certain chemical compounds would show up if there was active methanogenic life on the surface of Titan and those chemicals actually appeared. I won't get into too much detail on that one. This video is mostly about Enceladus, but still, it was an extremely compelling discovery. And then the moon Mimas, based on its orbital wobble, which is too large for a moon of its size, we think that there may be an ocean moving around inside this moon as well. And there are similar moons orbiting other gas and ice giants throughout the solar system, like Jupiter's Callisto, or also Neptune's moon Triton. The Goldilocks zone may just be one of many habitable regions of our solar system. And if that is the case, then we need to completely rewrite the rule book on where to look for life in the rest of the universe as well. Life may be just as natural as gravity is throughout our universe. I tend to believe that it is. From the discovery of phosphine in the clouds of Venus, where it absolutely should not exist without the presence of active life, to the label release experiments discoveries on the surface of Mars, to far more recent discoveries that strongly suggest that life was active at least in Mars past, to these recent discoveries in the Jovian worlds. I believe that we live in a solar system that is brimming over with life, that is just waiting for astronauts to go out and discover it. Thanks very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, thank you so much for all of your recent support. You have done so much to support this channel in recent days, and I will make sure to continue to produce unique and unusual content for you folks that you will never see on any other channel. It's the least I can do for everything you've done to support my work. Thanks again, and until next time, stay angry about space.